Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live. Here we are. Energy 808, the cutting edge. With Marco Mangelsdorf, Mina Morita. We're all together again. Wonderful to have you guys back online. All right, Marco, say hello. Hello, Jay. And uh, in the words of uh, the dearly departed Fred Rogers, uh, or paraphrasing him, it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful day to be back in this neighborhood with uh, two of my favorite energy neighbors. Neighbor? You're only saying that because we haven't had extreme weather yet, but it's coming. Uh, Mina Morita, you know about extreme weather, don't you? I sure do, and it's one of the reasons I haven't been with you guys for a while. And um, almost didn't make it today, but uh, I'm stepping out of a, a meeting right now, um, dealing with um, programs for displaced workers, um, getting them rehired and employed. Well, let's talk about Kauai for a minute. First, let's talk about how the flood, flood damage repair and uh, restoration is doing. I know you've been working on that diligently every day, so tell us the status. Well, it, it's coming along, but slowly. Um, you know, a portion of Kuhio Highway from right outside Hanalei, an area called Waikoko, all the way to the end of the road, um, KA, where Hyena State park and the Kalalau Trail begins, it's still restricted, and it's um, a one-way road, a one-way traffic in, one-way traffic out, um, using a convoy system. And so what's happening is a lot of people think it's okay because it's out of sight and out of mind, but I can see um, the toll of being... Um, restricted from the areas having on local residents. Um, you know, there, a lot of people are um, agitated. Um, you know, the, their recovery is slow. We have, you know, probably 30 families still in temporary facilities, um, wow. a lot of them. No, we haven't been either. hearing about that. You know, so what, what is your take on how long this is, it's gonna take to get back to normal? Oh, I, I'd say more than a year, if not longer, wow. because, um, you know, we're still dealing with about um, 20 families or more whose homes have been destroyed. And for them, um, they have to build to new building codes. And so, you know, since this is a tsunami area, not so much a flood area, but a tsunami area, they have to build um, higher. And uh, for example, this one house I'm familiar with, it's 16 feet off the ground. And, um, you know, they have to make the conversion from uh, cesspool to septic. System. Well, you know, this, so, is, this sounds like what happened after Iniki with that. And, uh, you know, it strikes uh -huh. me that Kauai has had more than its share of hard weather. Um, and there's, there's no particular reason for that. It's just the way the way the dice roll, and Oahu could have the next uh, the next bad weather. So I worry a lot about that. But let, but focusing right. back to Kauai for a minute, Mina, you know we've had mm -hmm. a report a report that came out uh, from uh, KIUC um, a couple days ago about what it's been doing, even in the face of the flood and all these troubles. Uh, and then we had a, an article in the newspaper. Uh, essentially re-reporting re that, that report. Um, so uh, uh, how, how familiar are you with what KIUC has been doing? Because according to the report, they've been doing very well in the last year. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I got my dividend check because we're a co-op, <laughs> you know. We, we, That's a good metric. <laughs> right, we distribute the prof profits and stuff, so I think I got my dividend checks maybe a week and a half ago, and I think I got about thirty-four dollars back or so. Now that's something. Um, yeah, and um, my understanding that they had a annual meeting yesterday, uh, where the uh, public was invited to come and um, discuss the, the year's progress with the board, and. You know, I, I think um, our renewable, um, right now, about 44% of our energy comes from renewable sources, and 
you know, they've been, I, I, I think I saw something where uh, they recently put out another RFP for renewable generation. Uh-huh. And, and not only are they putting more uh, renewables and storage um, up on the system, but they're also driving the price down. Mm. You know, Marco, how much is, is, of this has crossed your mm -hmm. desk? The report was uh, very detailed, and so were the newspaper articles. Well, I just to follow up on what Mina was saying, yeah, they had their 16th annual meeting uh, very recently, and there were about 200 people or so who attended, which is pretty darn good, uh, I think, especially for an island of that size. Uh, after the meeting, they were provided chili and rice, so the folks at KIUC know how to uh, do things island style, where you don't invite a bunch of people without having some good uh, ono grinds. Right, yeah, chil chili and them. rice and dividend uh, checks. How can you go wrong? Yeah. Uh, exactly. And, and, I, and exactly. what they've and what they've they've done in the past is give one bag rice. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Bag rice. So I, I'm not sure if they did that yesterday, but that's usually the tradition. <laughs> so Marco, well, you know, what, what do you get out of, uh, you know, that report? What do you get out of their progress? Um, you know, where, where, where do they fit in terms of uh, the whole state? Where do they fit on the landscape? Well, I think it's really uh, a testimony to uh, President and CEO David Bissell and his great staff from Mike Imani, Brad Rockwell, Beth Tokioka, and the whole crew there at KIUC that they've been able to do uh, so so well. Uh, what I mean by so well is they're, they've been on a, a very proactive mission to effectively replace combustion generation, combustion in terms of using fossil fuels with uh, lower cost renewable energy, principally solar, but they've also got some uh, uh, pumped hydro in the works as well, which is not producing power, but allows, uh, let's say, excess solar power produced during the day, use that energy to pump water up elevation and then have it come downhill uh, at night, uh, let's say, when the, when the demand is higher. So I, I think they've done a superb job doing that. and. Uh, they closed, like Mina said, 2017 with 44% of its mix coming from renewable sources. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised within the next handful of years that that figure goes up to somewhere in the 60 to 70% range. So they are soon to overtake, if they have not having overtaken already, uh, Helco because of the loss of Pune Geothermal Venture. So I think the combination of uh, lower cost renewables and bringing in these fixed contracts, power purchase agreements at somewhere in the 11 and sub, sub 11 cents a kilowatt hour range, uh, including battery storage, which makes uh, solar power more firm power, i.e. being able to provide power uh, during uh, longer periods of the day if not 24 hours a day, is uh, is a great uh, uh, marker for that uh, that uh, co-op on Kauai to make fantastic progress in terms of uh, bringing on board lower cost renewables, offsetting uh, combustion generation, and over time stabilizing the cost of electricity for its members. And they also noted in the in the press release uh, of uh, of the the meeting of last week that uh, they're not anticipating uh, doing any rate increase filing in the near future. And uh, I think that's uh, that's again a testament to to Dave and, and the crew. There, I mean, it's it's, it's a stretch uh, and, a, and a challenge to to be able to say, well, we can we have a plan to bring the cost of electricity down over time because there are fixed costs in terms of providing electricity beyond just generation. But even to get to the point where they can. Uh, plan out the, the, the likelihood or possibility of stabilizing pricing over time so that uh, it stays stable, I think, is, is quite a feat in and of itself. And that I think they're making great progress towards that end. What's the uh, interaction between the Tesla, the Tesla facility they built a year or two ago uh, with batteries and solar and all that, and the new one that I'm not sure what the status is with AEH? Uh, which uh, I remember reading part of that report said that the AEH um, project was bigger than Tesla. I'm not sure what that means, uh, exactly how big Tesla is. But wh where do those two fit together? How do they work together? They're both big. Uh, they're both uh, done or being done by a company called AES. I believe AES, uh, Distributed Energy, is there out of Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe Mina can... Uh, can check me on that, uh, but they, uh, the first project that uh, 
Lawa I, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, 20 megawatts of, um, hold on here, I'm just looking at it. 20 megawatts of storage, five-hour dispatch capability, uh, 11 cents a kilowatt hour, well below the cost of oil. And then uh, in late 2017, they were awarded a lease by Department of Defense for a 14 megawatt solar plus battery storage at the Pacific Missile Range Facility at Barking Sands that also achieved or received PUC approval, and that's just a little bit less uh, in terms of 10.85 10 cents, 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So uh, again, this allows KIUC to effectively retire combustion generation as this new cheaper renewable generation is, uh, is brought online. Yeah, that's great. You know, uh, uh, some of this must uh, be you know, uh, some of this we have to give credit to the county of Kauai, don't you think, Mina? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say no, that? I, no, I, you know, I give credit to the leadership at KIUC mm -hmm. and, and the board, the board setting the, um, the goals and objectives and then the, the, the management team at KIUC staying focused in, um, moving forward, and I have to emphasize in a cost-effective way. Um, there, there are a couple of things that I wanted to um, mention. First of all, you know, clarify that the pump storage is a uh, project that's being planned um, right now, that, that it's not anything that's online right now. Um, the second thing is what has been really impressive is, you know, you're dealing with a utility that really understands their system and is willing to take um, some risk because they really understand their system. And so what's happening is the duration of um, renewables on the system, maximum penetration of renewables on the system, that duration is um, more frequent now. You know, the, 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 I know there are uh, many times that they've hit over 90% renewable um, during the day, and that's happening more frequently at longer duration. Mm. And that's, that's, again, because they have um, batteries um, uh, situ situated and doing the right things uh, to make the, the system more stable. Marco, what can we learn um, from what can we learn from what's going wait, on in Kauai? I, got, I have oh, I have one, have something I more have to say. More thing. Wait, yeah, go ahead. I go have ahead, one Mina. more thing that I want to mention. The other thing that is very impressive is the financial soundness as we move forward. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that um, KIUC points out is when the co-op first started, they were 100% in debt. They had no equity. And I believe, I can't remember the exact number, but I think it's over 20%. Okay. Mark, Marco, do you, do you remember what that figure is? In terms of how much equity that they have uh, developed after yeah, purchasing how, yeah. it roughly 15 years ago? Yeah. Or 16 years ago. Uh, let me see if they have said that 100% to um, weighted weighted no. average cost of debt has dropped from more than 4% in 2002 to 2.67% today. Uh, they ended up with the year-end margin for 2017 of 3.2 million, which, as you know, was recently returned to members in the form of patronage capital retirements, i.e., checks in the mail to the 33,000 mm -hmm. or so members. Okay. Do they retain? Uh, but, they retain cash. They retain equity. Yeah. The re it, 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 there's a sentence in the uh, press release where it mentioned that they had um, zero equity. And it's up. It's over. I know it's over twenty percent now, but I thought it was higher. So my question to Marco was, uh, you know, what can the rest of the state learn from what's happening and what is reported uh, by KIUC in this report? Uh, it just makes it very clear, I believe, of the imperative and the practicality and the imminent doability of uh, being able to move aggressively, rapidly, and down the road, uh, down the path of retiring 
combustion generation that relies on fossil fuels and replacing it with cost-effective renewable energy uh, that most likely as we move forward will have more and more storage attached to or associated with that renewable energy. So let me ask you one other thing uh, about so, Kauai. So I, I, wanna, I wanna mention one more, I mean, it's, it's not the retirement of units, but what I believe, the reason why KIUC can move a little bit more quick, quickly is because they have the right kind of combustion engines um, on their system that are more flexible and quick start that can um, complement um, um, renewables. You know, they have the right complement of uh, combustion engines, um, battery, both battery to monitor um, frequency, um, storage, and as well as the renewable projects online. So it's it's not one thing or another, it's a combination on how the system is run. Okay, we're gonna take a short okay. break, you guys. Mina Marita, Marco Mangelsdorf, mm -hmm. uh, they join us by, um, by remote from Kauai and Big Island. We'll be right back after the short break to discuss uh, PGV and CBRE. We'll tell you what that means right right after we come back. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me. One o'clock on a Monday afternoon to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And see you then. Okay, we're back. We're live. Um, and this is uh, Energy 808. Um, energy on the cutting edge in, in Hawaii here with Mina Morita. She joins us um, by remote from Kauai. She, she, she left a meeting to talk to us today. And Marco Mangelsdorf joins us by remote uh, from uh, Hilo, and he's with uh, ProVision Solar. And uh, we're talking about energy developments in, Hawaii, in Kauai. I, well, we did that already, Kauai, but now we're going to talk about PGV, and that's in the Big Island. So, Marco, what, what is the sad story going on now with PGV? So just uh, the quick background, Jay, is that the Puna Geothermal Plant has been offline for going on two months. They shut down, I believe, on or around May 3rd when the uh, fissures started creeping, uh, popping up out of the ground there in the so-called lower rift zone of, uh, of Kilauea. And they have been uh, down ever since. The only access uh, to the, the plant, which has been partially partially overrun by lava, but most of the, the plant is, is intact. In order to get there, they have to chopper people in, which they do on a semi-regular basis. So those have been uh, megawatts uh, and megawatt hours of uh, renewable energy that have not been provided to HELCO uh, since early May. And uh, I'm going to be a bit provocative and uh, publicly take the stand that it's time for for Helco and Hawaiian Electric to seriously consider uh, canceling the contract that they have with ORMAT, with PGV, which they've had since 1993. Actually, the contract itself, the original one, goes back to 1986, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 32 years ago. And I would think, although I don't have a copy of the contract in front of me, I'm trying to get a hold of one, that there are force measure uh, reasons as well as non-performance reasons for Helco to cancel the contract. And well, the what's the I'm benefit of canceling the contract? I mean, why? It, why do we need to do that? 
twofold, Jay. Number one is that when you have a contract that's based on avoided cost, which is, we'll call it the wholesale rate of electricity, the avoided cost of electricity here in the state is based on the cost of imported oil. As oil goes up, avoided cost goes up, and it effectively ends up being a windfall for the power producer because their, their costs aren't going up as they're getting more money from the utility company based on the price of oil going up. So 25, the first 25 megawatts of roughly 35 plus megawatts from PGV prior to them going offline was being compensated from Helco at the avoided cost rate, and that is not in the benefit of ratepayers. What's in the benefit of ratepayers is to do exactly what KIUC is doing, which is replacing generation that's expensive, avoided cost, and, and replacing it with cheaper renewable at a fixed cost that's going to stay fixed over time. So that's the number one reason that the contract should be canceled, uh, in my opinion. And second is that if this contract is allowed to be maintained in force, the limbo land that we are in and that Helco is in for the foreseeable future, not just months, but possibly years, because Mary, Harry Kim has made clear that he's not going to order any bulldozing to go on in terms of opening roads, conceivably, to get to the plant until at least six months of no volcanic activity. And Harry Kim has said, in his own words, that he sees if PGV were to come back, and that's a big if, that it's two to three years out. So, in my opinion, it's better sooner rather than later for Helco to pull the plug on PGV, take out this uncertainty about will it come back or won't it come back, and move faster and more aggressively towards developing renewable energy sources at a fixed lower cost with storage if needed, and move this island similarly in a rapid direction like KIUC has done. Well, put pulling the plug that way, terminating the, uh, the payment power purchase agreement, uh, that would that would seal the fate of PGV. That would be the end of it, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. And PGV has a $100 million insurance contract, if I'm not mistaken. I think, uh, you know, not having privy to their internal documentation, I think they would probably be just fine. And again, uh, this is something that if I were Alan Oshim or Jay Ignacio, I would certainly get my legal people there at Hawaiian Electric to comb through this contract and make sure that there's no little to no risk on Hawaiian Electric's part if they were to go ahead and cancel the contract. But I have to believe just in, the, in you know, you're an attorney. Uh, Jay, and I'm sure you have some, some background in contract law, that with a contract like a power purchase agreement, there are, claw, there are outs that either party can use legitimately if there is non-performance of the contract terms and conditions. So I've got to believe that those are there. As it, an energy matter, are you saying that we don't need PGV anymore? Uh, we don't need uh, geothermal. Let's just get on other, other ways to generate renewables. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm not anti-geothermal per se, Jay. I just am a I'm a pro ratepayer and pro reality check and this geothermal power plant had a great run for 25 years, and I'm very appreciative of what Mike Calacchini and the whole group at uh, PGV have been able to do, but the time has come to an end. Uh, the time has come to put an end to PGV definitively so that Helco and the ratepayers of this island can move on in a faster, more aggressive fashion to be able to bring lower cost, firm, renewable power online. Okay, Mina, I'm sure you have some thoughts about this. <laughs> what are you thoughts about this? Well, I, I, I think um, we shouldn't disregard a potential energy source. I definitely do think that um, contracts need to be renegotiated. And um, so, but, uh, but I think it's just premature at this time to um, think about um, eliminating, you know, what was firm base load Power. I think we better understand the risk posed, and I think that um, this is why we should be promoting um, a diversity of resources. That you know, not one type of resource is going to um, be the um, panacea uh, as we move forward. So, I say we keep all options open um, and just better understand the risk that geo thermal poses, um, you know, as we pursue a um, low-carbon future. And I, and I don't want to say renewable future. It's a low-carbon future because we should be using 
um, everything in our in our toolkit um, to be reducing carbon um, and not necessarily just promoting renewables. So we have to look at this system wide. Marco, you want to take the last word on it? Yeah, interestingly. Now, Mina, remind me, please. You were PUC chair in 2011, right? Yeah. So 2011, there was a, uh, an addendum to the contract with PGV that brought on board more geothermal generation at a lower fixed cost, anything above yeah. essentially 25 megawatts. And you yeah. and, and Mike Champley and Lorena Kiba uh, were very clear in, in this DNO where you essentially lamented the fact that the 25 megawatts were stuck, and this is my word, stuck at avoided cost. Mm -hmm. And that the PUC, right. which you headed, was not did not have the authority to change or or force uh, ORMAT to renegotiate the 25 megawatts. So I, I just mm -hmm. want to play your own words back to you. And I'm not saying you're you're, you're opposing what I'm saying by any means. I'm not. I'm not. Your you know, we. Yeah. I mean, I have no problem. You know, I'm, my position is still the same. To um, it, if possible, renego renegotiate the contract. And this might be the best opportune position because the circumstances have changed because they can no longer conform to the, the, the um, contracts in hand right now. So yeah, it might be the best time to um, relook um, you know, all the legal implications in, in the contract. Yeah, and, the business, and the business my, implications it, as well. Because uh, yeah. Ormat's going to have to make a hard decision uh, but, as but to whether to try to continue or I drop heard, it. Right. What I heard Marco say is, you know, abandon this resource and abandon this facility. And I think that that decision is premature. Okay. Wow. Good discussion. We never got to our last mm -hmm. point, which is community solar, which we'll do next time in two weeks, if you don't mind. Uh, but thank you very much, you guys, for coming on. It's like good old days. Mina Morita from Kauai and Marco Mangelsdorf uh, from Hilo. Thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be thank more you, news. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha. Thanks, bud. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Jay. Thanks, Marco. Thank you. <laughs>